Well, first I want to say welcome everyone um, to this series of sessions. They will be delivered jointly um, starting with Carl today. Next week, me, myself, I'm Krasitsaneva and Kyle, Kyle Wedgwood <laughs> is a um, um, lecturer in the, the mathematics department and I'm professor in the mathematics department. And then we have Piotr, who is uh, also going to do the third session. Um, Piotr is a, a research fellow in the Wellcome Trust funded ICSF uh, tree center. Uh, and Kyle is a former research fellow from that center. So um, it's an initiative <laughs> under the quantitative <laughs> biology and medicine at Exeter network. Is it, is it coming? Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Occasionally Thanks. there's an echo, but I, I can't figure out why. I will, yeah, I will just let you know, try. So um, we're doing this for the first time. Uh, and we are hoping to learn as we go along. So we really would appreciate um, feedback uh, throughout the session. After the session, we'll send you a link with a few questions. And we, we would like to do this every, other, every after session, <laughs> after every session, sorry. Um, because, um, because we will be adjusting as we go along and we want to really find out what works well and what doesn't work very well. And uh, we obviously, that will help you get most out of this, of these experiences. Um, it is dedicated on introducing mathematical modeling. Uh, Kyle will talk about this uh, today. Um, and and um, we will also, as we go along, use MATLAB and specifically MATCONT, which is an um, interactive toolbox in MATLAB. And um, we felt it's one of the easiest ways to uh, implement and simulate uh, models, dynamics, dynamical systems models. So in, in most of you probably have used um, Zoom. It has a raise hand function. Uh, that you are welcome to use. You're also welcome to use the chat if you have any questions during the sessions. It is um, important to keep uh, yourself muted for, for the sake of clarity and um, uh, smooth um, interaction during the session. And, um, and if if I have missed something, I'm, I'm going to hand over to Kyle now, but if I have missed something, Kyle, Kyle can add and um, he can then proceed with, with um... oh, sorry, yes. So we are recording the sessions and we're going to make them available. We're also going to make the lecture slides and various codes available um, to, to all of you. Uh, Kyle already sent some some of the code that is going to be used today. So yeah, we're planning to make all these available also for the for some of you that may be not able to attend sessions. All right, so Kyle. Very good. Well, I hope everyone can hear me and I hope also that everyone can see my screen. Um, I'm seeing some nods, which is good. Um, so as, as Krasi says, this is the first time we're doing it. Um, uh, especially in this format with the with the lockdown, it would be great to see everyone in person. But uh, uh, coronavirus had other plans. Um, so just a few things just to say up front, um, as well as giving us feedback on the sessions. If there's anything that you're uh, unclear about or that, that sort of we haven't explained uh, particularly well, uh, please feel free to email us uh, after the session, between sessions, whenever. I've listed our three email addresses on the slide, and uh, and if you have any ideas for what we could do differently, please get in touch uh, as soon as possible. We want to try and make this as uh, as uh, adaptive as possible for everybody. 
the other thing to say is, um, you know, we appreciate that of the people that are, are, are in this course, some people will be familiar with um, sort of the basics and fundamentals of, of modeling and programming. Some people may uh, be coming to sort of general uh, interest and, and may not really have any experience. We try to design the course in such a way that it should be um, easy, well, not easy, but it should be understandable for people, even if they don't have any experience. Um, the thing to say about that as well is that we've chosen examples to go through in the course that are instructive uh, and because they're things that we're used to. That does not mean that uh, this type of modeling and this framework cannot be applied to, to your systems. I know that many of you come from very disparate backgrounds. So if you have any questions about how your particular model system could be, could be described mathematically, again, please get in touch. Um, I mean, we see this as uh, not only an opportunity for, for you guys to learn a little bit about modeling, but for us to engage with the wider community in Exeter. Um, so uh, as Krasi says, if anyone has anything to say um, during the course while I'm speaking, or if, if you need me to clarify something, just raise your hand. Krasi and Piotr will uh, monitor the chat and uh, hopefully we can catch everything as it goes. So, um, oh. so the, the course is, is going to cover the development of, of mathematical models. And, and we're focusing really here on, on relatively simple um, mathematical models. So you, you may well be aware that, particularly in climate, there are some quite, um, quite now mature and complicated models. Uh, we're not going to focus on that because you really start, you really need to know a lot more about the system. We're going to focus on um, biological systems that uh, we can, we can uh, use sort of a phenomenological description rather than trying to describe all of the processes that are going on. We're going to be using MatCont uh, and, and more generally MATLAB to simulate these models. Uh, most of this in weeks one, two and three will be a, a GUI based system, so more point and click. Uh, in week four, we will do some, some basic MATLAB coding uh, to do systems that have inherent noise. We're going to be using a tool called bifurcation analysis. Um, I won't really talk so much about that today, um, but Krasi and Piotr will pick up on this in weeks two and three. This is, uh, if you like, in nonlinear dynamical systems, this is our bread and butter. Uh, in fact, Piotr actually has a very nice bifurcation diagram uh, sitting behind him there, which is all very colorful. Uh, and, and we'll write code. Um, and I've, I've written code in inverted commas here because I don't want this to put anybody off um, who hasn't really done any coding before. The code that we're going to use for MatCon is, is really, really simple. I think of it as a, you know, you, you, you write what you see. You, you have a mathematical equation in front of you and you just convert it into code. Um, as you start developing more and more complicated systems and more complicated models, you have to try and do different things to, to make the, uh, the computation efficient, but we won't be dealing with any of that. And so hopefully in the end, uh, by the end of the course, you'll be able to have a look at uh, equations in mathematical models and be able to interpret what they mean. Um, this is the very first thing that, that we learn as mathematical modelers, and it's, it's basically fundamental to the whole process. So every time you write down an equation, every time you write down a term in a model, you should be able to attribute it to a specific process. And if you can't do that, then it really means that you really need, you need to refactor your model somehow. Uh, we're going to be able to simulate models in an appropriate environment, which for us will be MATLAB. Um, some of you may have used other environments before, so Python, R, C, Java, whatever. Um, as far as I'm concerned, they're all the same. I know that there are differences, but ultimately the end goal is, is the same. So we're focusing on MATLAB here just because, um, well, the university has a license, which helps. Um, and also there are nice tools that the community have developed. We're going to be focusing, as I said, on simple models. And the important thing here is really that we're going to use our bifurcation analysis to predict what the models are going to do even before simulating them. Uh, and hopefully by the end of it, you'll have some ideas about how to develop your own models, um, either with or without the three of us. So in this first session today, uh, I'm going to Give you a brief overview of mathematical modeling. Um, the goal is not to be comprehensive but just to give you a flavor of what it is, what it's used for, what it's not, um, and then to motivate our first example which will be of a biochemical oscillator. Um, the sessions are all structured in such a way that there'll be part of it will be uh, didactic and part of it will be interactive. We'll discuss how the interactive bit is going to work a little bit later. Uh, that is something that we have trialed but never really used uh, in the field as it were. Uh, and we're going to use 
even Matt Con, as I said, which hopefully everyone has got installed. I've spoken to a few people, and I know Piotr has spoken to a few people. Um, yeah, occasionally it, it does throw up some bugs when you try and install it. If anyone hasn't done it, um, we will discuss that later before we actually use it. And, and one of the three of us will try and will try and get you up and running. Uh, and the Brussel laser system, which is this simple biochemical oscillator I mentioned earlier. So the first thing to ask then is just, you know, when we say mathematical model, what do we actually mean? Um, it's, it's, it's a word that is now, or a phrase rather, which is now becoming quite popular, particularly amongst the, uh, in the biological community. Um, and it's bounded around a lot without any kind of meaning attributed to it. So in general, um, you know, a, a classic model that, that everyone sees pretty much on a daily basis is, is weather forecasting and climate forecasting. So um, we're, we're now in a, in, a, in an era where these models are actually really good now, um, you know, far from when they used to just stick up little placards uh, on a map of the UK, but actually we can get uh, information about what the weather is doing and, and predictive uh, information about what the weather is doing, even up to sort of five, six days in advance. Um, and really all of this is generated by things that look like this. So to me, this is a mathematical model, um, or at least the most general form of a mathematical model. So X dot here, so X just represents anything you want to know. It's a piece of information in your system. Um, we'll talk about different kinds of variables that, that could be in a system later, but absolutely anything. So in the case of a weather forecast, you might care about precipitation, you might care about temperature, you might care about wind. Um, all of these different things uh, go into your X. And the little dot there is just a sort of physics notation for that means rates of change. So X dot is the rate of change of your state variable. So, you know, it's not a question of necessarily what is the temperature now, it's how is it evolving over time. And F here is basically everything that the model does. So it's a function, um, so F for function, and it describes the way that these things evolve. So um, by, by knowing where we are now and by knowing maybe a little bit about um, what the weather was doing in the past, we can predict how it's going to go moving forwards, and our F encapsulates all of that complexity. Most of the time, um, the things that we deal with uh, that are sufficient, occasionally we need to, to think about time, time varying things. So the F here, you can see, is a function of two variables, X, which is all of the things we mentioned before, and time. Uh, in the models that we're going to be discussing, there won't really be an explicit dependence on time. It makes the analysis a little bit harder, um, although there are good reasons for including it. So the, the title of this course was, was mechanistic modeling. Uh, I will touch uh, in a little bit about differences between uh, statistical modeling, which is another kind of modeling that people use for, for prediction. But the point of mechanistic modeling is really trying to get a hold of, uh, trying to get a handle on the processes that drive this behavior. So the F here is really, really important. Um, if you're very, very lucky, your system is linear um, and things, and, and, and in that case, you can pretty much predict everything about your system. Most of the time, it's not. It will be some nonlinear function f. Um, and, and really trying to get the nonlinearities right is the goal of mathematical modeling. OK, so how do we develop them? Well, in general, there's, there's two different kinds of ways that people approach it. Uh, you, you might hear them classed as top down and bottom up. So I've, I've used this as a, as a prototypical example of, of how biological models are developed. So at the, the top, we have sort of ecosystems, which, which could include the entire world. So this is the, the network interactions of all living things. Um, underneath that, you know, we have organisms and then we can have, um, you know, organ systems and then we can have cells all the way down to, you know, building blocks, including proteins and DNA and, and even further than that. Um, so quantita, sorry, uh, quantum biology is now becoming a, a big thing. And so, and the real, the real, driver of, of modeling is to try and understand how these things all fit together. So one approach is to say, look, all I really care about is how ecosystems are evolving. So your state variables in that would be the populations of the species that you care about and you define how they all interact with each other. On the other hand, you could start at the bottom and move your way up. So you want to say, look, I want to know how this very specific protein affects uh, the behavior of the rest of the network. So in that case, your state variables would be your proteins, would be your mRNAs, um, anything else that describes your uh, particular system of interest. And usually what you try and do is you try and define a system um, and, and reduce the stuff, the information that's coming from the, either the top down or the bottom up. Because what you really want to do is, is you want to try and isolate the system of interest. Um, it's really hard to do in general systems because 
you know, uh, no man is an island. So said John Donne. And, but that is part of the, the, the role of the mathematical modeler is to try to figure out if you try and if you pick a specific set of variables or a specific system, what are the things that you can safely throw away and what are the things that really have to be there? So it's really trying to find, find a, a nice middle ground. And the point is that, you know, this is system specific. So you pick your level of description. You kind of know what your biological question is and you formulate the model around that rather than the other way around. So why do we use them? You know, because you could just say, look, we're at the end of the day, well, most people here, I guess, are interested in biology. Do loads of experiments, which is the sort of the classic uh, viewpoint. Well, here I've just outlined a few reasons why I think um, that models are really useful. Um, these are not the only reasons. I'm, I'm sure other people can think of others. But so, so firstly, we, we can track lots of different variables. Um, very often when we measure things in, in whatever kind of experiment, um, we can only keep track of certain things and we have to try and infer um, the so-called missing data. Of course, in a model, everything is specified. Once you've picked your F, you, you kind of have knowledge of what all of your systems are doing. Um, so it's, it's kind of useful for keeping track of things that are otherwise hidden. Uh, and in a similar vein, they, they account for processes we can't observe. So I, I put this slide together some four years ago now. Um, I didn't realize, I couldn't have predicted that in 2020, this would actually be probably the most topical thing. Um, so here, you know, the, the big, big problem with, with predicting what's going to happen in an epidemic or even a pandemic as we're in now, is that whilst we can see who's infected and we kind of know who's susceptible and we know who's dead, the thing that we really need to know is how many people are infectious but not yet symptomatic. Um, so this is a process that's really difficult to observe in real life, but in a model we can factor it in and we can start thinking about mitigation strategies for when we don't have that, the whole information. Um, and this is probably a big one, and, and, and I think from the, the biology perspective, this is the most important, that it's a lot quicker and a lot cheaper to simulate mathematical models than it is to run an experiment. Um, the startup time is essentially um, how long it takes you to understand the system and write down the equations that govern it. Um, and you can basically whack a whole bunch of simulations onto supercomputers like this um, and have you know, millions of simulations done within the same time frame that it would take you to do a single experiment. They're predictive. Um, if a model is not predictive, it's not very useful. Um, so the idea here is that you, you have a model and if you're pretty comfortable or pretty confident that the, your the nonlinearity that you've chosen in your function f is correct, then what you should be able to do is to start asking questions, well, what happens if I take it outside of the confines of the, the where, where I define the model? So what happens if I, if I expose this system to a new drug? What happens if I do some sort of gene editing and, and, and knock out a particular gene? Uh, what happens if I introduce a new species into my ecosystem? Uh, these are the kind of questions that you can, you can ask with these models. And it's much, you know, it's better to have a model that predicts it first rather than spend a lot of money on an experiment only to find out that, that it was never going to work in the first place. They can identify specific mechanisms. So, so over on the right here, um, this is probably for mathematical biologists, one of the sort of most famous examples. So this is the Turing's theory of morphogenesis. And really what this allowed us to do is to think about, well, you know, why does the leopard have its spots? Why, do, why are fish stripy? Um, and the, the mathematics behind this is, is simple but powerful. And it shows us where to look. It shows us what kinds of things we should be looking at. And of course, you know, I guess you might care. Why, why do we wonder why do we care about stripes or spots? But the same kind of mechanisms are also what determine uh, where our fingers go, where the vertebrae and our spines are, and development on a, of a whole different kind of uh, systems. So understanding these specific mechanisms is really important, but generalizing them to, to all kinds of biological systems, you can do in mathematical models. Uh, oops, lost my uh, uh, no. So simplification. So um, as I said before, what you really want to do is to isolate the bits of the system that you actually care about. It's very, very easy. And certainly as someone who comes uh, into biology from the outside, I, I often get lost uh, in the complexity of everything. But in, in mathematical models, you can show that, that very, very simple descriptions can actually be really powerful and really predictive. And, and this, is, um, this is really what you want. You want to drill it down to the simplest possible description of your system that is predictive. Um, this is something that's become really, really popular over the sort of the last 30, 40 years about bridging scales. So we know that, that life as we know it 
um, occupies a whole range of uh, both spatial scales and temporal scales ranging from the atom, atomistic description we described earlier all the way up to ecosystems. In fact, this, this graph doesn't even go up to ecosystems, it stops at humans. Um, and it's really hard to, to, to think about how to connect all of these things in a meaningful way. But in mathematics, again, if you get these functional relationships right between these different levels of descriptions, you can be predictive from one level to the other. And finally, um, it can be helpful in, in making decisions. So thinking back to the coronavirus, understanding um, about what the, what the data and the processes that we're, that we're not seeing in the data um, could be really, really useful for understanding how we move forwards. Uh, and in particular for things like drug trials or, or clinical, if we have a predictive model, we can, we can make various checkpoints along the way to make sure that what we're seeing in, in, in reality is well matched to what we expect. Okay, I don't want to dwell too long on this, but I thought it would be really, really useful just to, um, to talk very, very quickly about the differences between mechanistic and statistical modeling. And the first thing to say is that I would probably estimate that every single person in this, this room now, whether you know it or not, has done some modeling in the past, um, probably of the statistical variety, because anytime you ever do any kind of hypothesis test in statistics, you are actually formulating some sort of model. Um, but that's not what this course is about. We're focusing on, on mechanistic models. And really, one of the key differences is that mechanistic models tend to focus on specific processes or mechanisms. You're really trying to get an understanding about how a specific process affects a specific outcome. Whereas statistical modeling tends to focus much more on general phenomena. It's trying to find relationships between variables and use this to predict what's going to happen downstream. Uh, and the F, which we talked about earlier, can essentially have any functional form. Um, you know, this normally comes from an understanding about what the key processes and the key relationships between the variables in your system are. Um, sometimes these are empirical um, for systems that we don't have much information about, but the point is that you know, there's, there's, no, there's no real constraint. In statistical models, especially if you want to do hypothesis testing, um, you typically assume quite simple relationships. Um, so linear correlation, for example, or yeah, I suppose you could have nonlinear correlations, but even then you're quite constrained. And this is to take advantage of the, of the power of statistical testing, which kind of falls away when you start using all different kinds of um, different kinds of interactions. And importantly, you know, when we talk about mechanistic modeling, we're, we're really thinking about complex dynamic behavior. Uh, whereas in statistical modeling, whilst they, they can do time dependent systems, again, these relationships over time tend to be quite simple. So, so things like um, uh, autoregressive models where you, you correlate future behavior with past behavior, but only at kind of a linear level. Uh, and so, okay, and this is probably the most important thing is when would you use one versus the other? So mechanistic modeling is really useful for when you're testing specific hypotheses about input-output relationships in your system. So when you know a little bit about, about your system and you want to test whether something is, is, is going to be true or not. Um, statistical models are, are best used, in my opinion, when it's actually really, really hard to get prior information. So, for example, if you have very, very large data sets and you're trying to do some predictive modeling, but, you know, there's simply no way you can extract these complicated functional forms, then statistical approaches are the way to go. And, and the, main, the main thing here is that, that both of them are useful uh, in different contexts and they both provide quantitative predictions. Um, they just do it in a slightly different way. Okay, so it would be remiss of me to, to talk about more explaining what it can't do. Um, so in print, you can throw variables in the system as you like. At some point you run into the, what's called IC, so illustrated here. So this is a, an example where we're going up in spatial dimensions. So if you have a one dimensional system, you're, you're very much constrained with how many uh, actually interacting elements you can deal with. Uh, as you go into two dimensions, obviously then this goes up uh, by quadratic and then you hit three dimensions and in principle you don't have to stop there but each time you add a dimension you are massively expanding uh, the number of states of your system so that's fine um, except computer power doesn't pick up doesn't keep up to speed uh, with that and it also makes the models kind of intractable you know uh, at some point you lose predictive power when you cannot attribute specific outcomes with specific processes as you start to make your system bigger uh, some of you maybe less fewer of you now will might remember this this scenario coming back to the weather so uh, <laughs> i can see a hand going up there so this was the this was the the famous michael fish uh, 
prediction that there wasn't going to be a hurricane uh, in the UK, and, and, and there was. Uh, and I, you know, I put this up as, a, as an example because it, it wasn't so much that the models were wrong. Um, and in, in fact, in many cases, although, although the models have been adjusted and fine-tuned over the years, I, I don't think that the models that, that, that he was using were wrong. The problem was that it's actually sometimes really difficult to get a handle on what the actual parameters of the system are. So for something like weather and climate, where we're dependent on, on for example, on the ground on weather stations, um, if we, it's quite hard to interpolate what's going to happen in between those. So you can still make wrong predictions, even if your model is correct, if you're not very confident about your parameters. The computational cost of this, this relates back to the curve. Uh, so this is a, a graphical depiction of Moore's law. There is a question yes. from there is a question from Yolanda. When you talk about dimensionality, is this comparable to the number of variables in your model? Uh, essentially, yes. Um, although it, it depends on the way that your model is set up. So if if you're talking about you know going from ten variables to I don't know fifteen variables, twenty variables, it's it's not such a big problem. Um, where where the the cursor dimensionality really really hurts you is if you're doing things um, like network analysis. So, so for example, if you, if you look at what people do in the bioinformatics community, where they, they, they think about um, the sort of omics graphs, so which you know, proteins or genes interact with which, which others, um, when you add in more variables there, it's not that the number of variables themselves kills you, it's the fact that the, the number of possible interactions between the state variables um, goes up by, by a combinatorial factor. Um, so, so really, it, it really depends on what you, you think are the relationships between your variables. Does that make sense, Yolanda? The, uh, by... Yes, thank you. Thanks, that's perfect. Brilliant. Sorry, I can't see the chat, so I'm, I'm reliant on the... And also, if you do want to ask a question, um, if, if Piotr or Krazy, you can just tell me and then you can unmute yourself to ask the question. Uh, I think that that would also work um, really well. Um, so, so this is a graphical depiction of Moore's law, which talks about um, essentially the, um, the capability of us to do these, these big large scale simulations. So you can see here at the, the bottom time, we have the doubling time of 1.2 years. So this is um, originally to do with the number of transistors you could fit on a computer chip, but now it's, it's looking at what's on the Y axis is floating point operations per second. So this is essentially how quickly can we do these big simulations. And as you, as your, there's, um, there's another question. Yep. Okay, so I'll read it. Interaction interactions are emerging as a limiting factor in designing sessions for online learning. Okay, that's interesting question. It was it was a comment because the we were talking about how we teach maths in online rooms and the fact that mm -hmm. if you're using an online whiteboard, you've got the square of the number as your interactions. Mm -hmm. So it's a limitation in designing our online learning. So it was sorry, it was a comment, not a question. No, but I, I think I think it's a good one as we as we deal with uh, we're trying to figure out how we're supposed to to take education into the this 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 new world uh, but i mean it is a good example and actually people do um in all seriousness people do think about mathematical models of social interactions uh, and education and and that and that kind of sort of shared working space would be would be one of them um and so there you have the uh the, the both the real life cursive dimensionality and the modeling cursive dimensionality um, so um, coming back to this graph, so this, this is basically saying that, uh, if, and you can see that the, the, the actual the empirical data match this, this line quite well. So essentially, you know, we, we can, as time marches on, do ever more complicated and more vast simulations, but there is still a limitation to what we can do. Um, and some of the kinds of systems that we would want to do, for example, looking at molecular dynamic simulations, we still have a long way to go before computational power catches up to the kinds of experiments that we'd want to run on these computers. Noise, so oh, uh, noise. 
So noise uh, is just inherent in everything. So biological noise is, is kind of everywhere. Measurement noise is everywhere, which comes back to point two about how do you actually find your parameters. There's also noise in, in, in the numerical computations as well, so something called round-off error. So our, our simulations are accurate only up to a point. And so we have to take all of this into account when we're, when we're assessing the, the quality of our predictions from our models. And of course, models can be wrong. Um, so the idea is to try and not be that wrong. Um, and in fact, you know, George Box famously said that all models are wrong, but some are useful. Um, and, and the key thing here is you can be wrong. It doesn't matter if you're wrong. Um, what matters is that you, uh, you update your model based on the new information um, and that you're not so far wrong that uh, everything that you get out is garbage. So I think the main, main thing here is don't be afraid of, of being wrong and, and updating things. So very, very quickly, just some examples of, of things that, that I've used modeling for in the past. Um, you know, this is sort of a bit of a, a selfish, uh, <laughs> selfish picking of systems because it's just things that I'm interested in. But um, so I, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about new. So on the left here, we've got the behavior of a single cell. And on the right, we have uh, visual patterns that you'd see uh, in, in your retina. So uh, if, you, if you squeeze your eyeballs, if, if you're that way inclined, you can see these kinds of patterns. And so there's a lot of like, mathematical machinery for connecting these two scales. So how can predictions from single cell modeling tell us about visual hallucinations? Um, scaling this up, there are two projects that I want to very quickly mention, the virtual brain and the human brain project. And both of these projects are really talking about how do you go from these quite sort of uh, single cell descriptions or single or populations of neural descriptions to, to modeling an entire brain. Um, so I guess, you know, they're trying to, they're trying to build a, a virtual brain uh, as, as indicated on the left there. Um, other things, um, so, so in Exeter, especially this, we spent a lot of time thinking about diabetes, both, both type one and type two. Uh, and of course there's all kinds of different arenas here in which one could think that mathematical modeling could be useful, both in terms of designing therapy and, and in the diagnostic stage of thinking about, well, actually what is the time course um, that we should really care about when we're trying to predict whether someone does have um, diabetes or even distinguishing between type one and type two diabetes, which is still an ongoing challenge. Um, in terms of drug delivery, people can uh, make predictions about, well, if you want to design nanoparticles for drug delivery, what is the best shape uh, and dosage to actually do this? Uh, and even right down to the stage of when we're, we're looking at sort of very much preclinical and fundamental stuff, um, what is the right thing to actually be targeting based on the, the dynamics and the shape of different antibodies and antigens. Um, and you, if, you, if you spend a lot of time looking at drug delivery, this is these kind of plots of things that you'll see quite a lot, the so-called PKPD. Um, so loosely speaking, this is about when you, when you give someone a pharmacological agent, what does it do to the body and what does the body do to the drug? Um, so it's thinking about how effective is the dose that you give it versus how quickly is it cleared from the system. And overall, this then is a, a way that you can predict what is going to be the optimal dosing strategy for a particular drug for a particular disease. Um, these are getting more and more complicated. So um, in the loosest possible sense, you can just think about, well, what is the drug doing in circulation? But now people are thinking much more about targeting specific organs. So you know where your drug needs to go. But of course, you, you, in most cases, you can't deliver it systemically. So you have to deliver it systemically. So then you can start thinking about, well, look, you know, if you get clearance from the liver at this rate, but then it goes to the target organ at this rate, um, this all affects your dosing strategy. Uh, and probably one of the, the biggest areas that modeling has seen an explosion over the last sort of 30 years is in cancer modeling, that all of its various different scales. So thinking about modeling, um, you know, genetic aberrations uh, that lead to cancer, but also thinking about how cancers grow, how we should reset tissue, how they revascularize, um, how they metastasize, all of these different kinds of questions have been answered by, by well, have been addressed by modeling in, in, at some level or another. Okay, and, and, and there's a host more, you know, these, these are just things that, 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 that I'm interested in, um, and I think that cover a wide range of, of, of different things, but just I haven't mentioned system here doesn't mean that it, it can't and probably hasn't been modeled at all. So I said this before, it um, doesn't really matter if models are wrong, so long as you take that into account. 
Um, so here's just a few very quick things about what modeling, what models should be. So obviously it should be a faithful representation. Um, and by that, I don't mean that you have to get it right all the time. It's just that it shouldn't deliberately be wrong. Um, really, you have to be able to, to use it to say something. Um, it's all very good, uh, well and good having some sort of ethereal model, um, but you actually need to practically be able to do something with it. We said right back at the beginning that it's got to be constructed at an appropriate level of description, so which you need to pick as the modeler, uh, and it needs to provide something uh, that you can test. Oh, and simple, but not too simple. It's complicated enough, but simple to analyze. And so this is sort of works. Uh, everyone who, who has trained in mathematical modeling has seen a version of this uh, in some shape or form. Uh, the idea is that you, know, you, you take in an, some experimental data, you formulate a model, you figure out what the model can do and can't do, you work out some parameters, you make a prediction, and then you go and test it. If the model's wrong, it doesn't matter. You go back and you start the loop again. You figure out what was wrong, and you go through this whole process again. Um, and essentially, making, getting around this loop as quickly as possible um, is, is really uh, the way that modeling should work. So your model should be adaptive, it should be flexible, and it, it, you should, it should be couched in a way that means that you can update it when new, when new evidence comes in. Okay, uh, I don't want to dwell too long on this because um, I want to get onto the first system that we're going to cover. So, um, as well as there being mechanistic and statistical models, there are also this other classification of models, which is really thinking about how complicated do you want your description to be. Um, so these are still mechanistic models, uh, but they are sub subdividing it those into into systems which we know quite a lot about, and we're we're trying to make very very specific hypotheses about you know, say a particular a drug target. Um, so these generally are, are, are taken quite a lot of information about, about the interactions between your state variables to begin with. The other class of models are, are much more descriptive, uh, much more phenomenological. So you kind of know what behavior you want to describe and you're really thinking about what are the base elements to think about this. So in the context of hallucinations, for example, you don't really need to know every single, what every single neuron in, in your, uh, and your cortex is doing to understand visual hallucinations. You just need to understand something very general about neuronal excitability and the way that the, the neurons themselves talk to each other. And the nice thing about phenomenological models is that um, you can often take results from one system and apply it to another. Uh, in general, a, a good thing to do is to think about, well, how, how can models written at one level of description be mapped onto models at another level of description? Uh, and this is the nice thing about mathematics because uh, a lot of these things generalize quite well. Okay, so that is my uh, very, very, very quick primer on, on mathematical modeling. I'd like to take a moment just to pause right here to, to see if there are any more questions. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to our first model. Uh, now, this may have sound on it, because I can't, I think I can switch it off, because normally I'm doing this in a room, but uh, there you go. Right, I might pause it there. <laughs> so, I, I guess, it, well, norm, at, this, at this point, normally I'd ask if anyone knows what that is, but um, it kind of seems, if you know, you can just write in the chat, otherwise um, I'll just tell you. Uh, so, so this is a, a biochemical reaction called the, the BZ reaction, or the bezel strebosinski reaction. And the idea is here that you have these two chemical, uh, well, actually quite a few different uh, chemical species that are interacting with one another. Uh, and they perform, they, they, they make these really beautiful um, oscillatory patterns. So if I play the movie again and, and you think about, you know, what would happen if you were measuring even just the color here or, or concentrations more formally at a very specific point in space um, and think about,
So I hope you can see that if, if you were measuring at a particular point in space, these waves of propagations, you would see them as oscillations locally. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to think about not this, this spatial system, so we're not thinking so much about the waves themselves, but we're going to assume that we've got a, a very well-mixed container. And we're going to think about just the how do we describe, how do we capture that oscillation. Uh, so it's a model called the Brusselator model. Uh, this is an example of, of a phenomenological model, if you like. Um, the name itself is just because the people who made it up uh, worked in Brussels and because it's a model of an oscillator, so Brussels oscillator or Brusselator model. Um, which shows you how imaginative we are at naming things. Um, and, and what we're going to do now is we're going we're to go through from uh, the basic processes of, of how you would write down this model to begin with, and then we're going to simulate it in MatCon. So we're going to assume that there are six chemical species, uh, A, B, D, E, X, and Y. And X and Y here are our, our key variables of, 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 that we're interested in. So chemical species X, chemical species Y. We're in a well-mixed environment, so we're not going to have any of these spatial patterns. Uh, and in fact, actually, we're just going to consider the concentrations of, of these six things uh, in, in like a, just a beaker. And we're also going to make some further assumptions. So we said that X and Y are the things that we really care about. And so what we're going to assume is that the A and B are provided in constant supply. Uh, there's a constant supply of A and B. So there's some sort of sensor that tells us when A is decreasing and, and, and more is pumped in to keep it at a constant level. And, and, it, and we don't really care about DNA. So we can assume that these are waste products, they're siphoned off, um, or they, they just decay and, and we don't care about them. So what that means is that we can essentially treat DNA as being zero and A and B as being at a fixed value, which we can take to be a parameter in our system. And we have these four reactions that, that govern our system. So anyone who's, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not a chemist at all. Uh, so I, I can't really tell you too much about where these originally, uh, you know, what system they originally came from, but we just have these four reactions. So A is converted to X at some rate K1. Uh, a second reaction that takes two molecules of X, one molecule of Y and produces three molecules of X. So this happens with rate K2. We have a third reaction, which takes uh, B, and X and produces a Y and a D at rate K3. And then we have uh, an X sort of decaying into this E state at rate K4. So these are four reactions. And, and our goal is to convert these reactions into a mathematical model. And we're going to do this in the simplest way, which is using something called the law of mass action. And the law of mass action basically says that um, the rate of the reaction is directly proportional to the product of the masses of the reaction, the reactants. Um, so loosely speaking, this kind of makes sense. The more you have of something, uh, the f well, if you have two things that are reacting, the more you have of both of them, you think the faster the reaction should go. And of course, this, this comes from uh, some empirical observations of the same thing. So you can, you can increase the concentration of your reactants and you can see the rate of reaction actually go up to some saturating point. So what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to take that, that, uh, that sort of rule uh, and we're going to apply it in a mathematical sense. And I'm going to break it down for you reaction by reaction, and then we'll form an overall equation, system of equations for the whole system. Um, so normally this would be more interactive, but um, I guess the, uh, the format might make that a bit difficult. But, but let's just go um, and, and, and define what these are. So remember that, so A, X, A, A B, D, E, X, and Y, are our state variables. And what we want to do is we want to write down an equation for the rates of change of these things. And in particular, we want to write down an equation for the rates of change of X and Y, because remember that we're assuming that A and B are constant and that D and E we just don't care about. So it doesn't really matter what they're doing. So if we consider the first reaction, we can, we can think about it like this. So the rate of the reaction, so remember that the dot here is really a rate, is directly proportional to the product of the masses. So the, the mass here, we're going to use A um, to define the concentration of A. So you know, all of these letters stand for the concentration of our chemical species. So the, um, the rate of the reaction, which produces X, is, is just given by the mass of the concentration of A. And it's multiplied by this proportionality constant K1, which is just chosen in you know, a big the k's are just chosen to be to be whatever you want at this stage. 
And the important thing here is that we're gaining x from this reaction. So A is being converted to x. So that also means that this, this term on the right-hand side is positive. So as A is being converted to x, of course, A is also going down, but, but we're assuming it's being replenished. So we have a positive K1 times A. Does everyone understand where that equation comes from? OK, I assume so. The, ne the next one is a little bit trickier. So here we're taking two x's and one y, and we're making three x's. So the key thing to note here is that in this reaction, we're gaining one x, and we're losing one y. So whatever we write down, it should be x dot is, a, is something positive, and y dot is something negative. Now, they're both, these two things are both happening in the same reaction. So they should both have a proportionality constant of K2. And the thing that, throws, that sometimes throws people here is that we have to remember that the rate of reaction is directly proportional to the product of the masses. Okay, so what we have to do is we've got essentially one X, another X, and a Y. So we multiply them together, and we get a term that is X squared Y. So X times X times Y. So although uh, in total, that gives us this then. So X, the rate of change of X is positive with a proportionality constant K2 times this product, which is X times X times Y, which we just write as X squared Y. Now, of course, remember Y is taking part in this same reaction. So Y is gonna have exactly the same form, except it's gonna be negative because we're using up one Y in this reaction. So Y is gonna look like that. Okay, is everyone happy with that? Okay, so we have a very, very sim similar thing for the third reaction. Of course, now we don't really care about what is happening with B, but now we're losing an X and we're gaining a Y. It's happening with a, with a rate K3. So now, now we need X dot is negative and Y dot is positive. And they're Proportionality, uh, sorry, the, uh, the, the rate of this reaction is going to be B times X. So again, just taking the products of the two things on the left. So X is going to be now decreasing by, minus, by K3BX, and Y is going to be increasing by K3BX. And then the final equation mirrors uh, equation, sorry, reaction one. So now we're just losing X at a rate K4. So this one is going to be uh, minus K4X. So as I said before, we haven't considered any of the A dot or B dot terms because we're assuming that they're being held constant. But now we have converted these four reactions into four sets of equations that, um, that govern the system. And what we do from here is we take this, we're going to group them into facts and things that affect Y. So there are four reactions that involve X and two reactions that involve Y. And then to get the total rate of change of X or Y, all we need to do is just add up these terms. So for X, we take them. So now we have K1A plus K2X squared Y minus K3BX minus K4X. We do exactly the same for Y and we get K3BX minus K2X squared Y. So all we're doing is we're just taking those equations, grouping them in terms of what affects X, what affects Y, and then essentially just summing them up. So the rate of the total reaction is just going to be the sum of all of the individual reactions. And to make life easy in this first example, so pinning down what the rates K1, K2, K3, K4 are can be quite difficult. So I'm just going to assume that they're held constant, and we're just going to consider the concentration of A and the concentration of B as parameters in our system. OK, so. Now here's the bit where potentially the wheels could come off the bus if that con doesn't work for everybody. So um, hopefully everyone has um, managed to get something working. So MatCon is a, is a piece of software for analyzing and simulating mathematical models. It runs in, in MATLAB, um, but you don't actually have to know any MATLAB to get it to work. And it's really just a graphical front end for a, a rich set of, of numerical routines. Um, obviously, we have a site license for MATLAB, so everyone should have been able to get MATLAB. Um, whether everyone got MatComp working is another question. Uh, but what we're going to do now is 
hopefully, and please, 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 at this point, if you haven't got it working, do type something in the chat, because um, otherwise it might be quite difficult. I'm going to switch to my, I'm going to switch off the, um, the, the talk here and go into, into my MacConf.